they can make their exit that way. Give them a little bit of time to get in there. There's Holly. I'd like to start by reading the passage of Scripture in its entirety first, and then we'll go back to it. But we're in Luke chapter 8, verses 22 through 25, so just four verses. And um, I've titled this sermon, Who Then Is This? Because that's one of the questions that is in this passage. But the Word of God says this, starting in verse 22. One day he and his disciples got into a boat, and he told them, Let's cross over to the other side of the lake. So they set out. And as they were sailing, he fell asleep. And then a fierce windstorm came down on the lake, and they were being swamped and were in danger. They came and woke him up, saying, Master, Master, we're going to die. And then he got up and he rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and so they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said to them, where is your faith? They were fearful and amazed and asking one another, Who then is this? He commands even the winds and the waves and they obey him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word this morning. And as always, Lord, we ask that you would direct us through this. Help us to not just understand it, but be able to apply it to our lives, Lord. It is so important for us to know. And I ask this in your precious name, amen. We've been going through the Gospel of Luke, and just recently we looked at the parable of the sower, or the parable of the soils, or the parable of the souls. And we learned some things along the way that as he is telling his disciples, when you go out with the Gospel, when you go out from here and you tell people about myself, Jesus Christ, sometimes that seed that you sow is going to fall on hard soil. And that hard soils people who will be indifferent to that message. You know, just kind of bounce off of them. And they said some of them will be like shallow soil. They'll hear that message, but they'll think, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? And they'll spring up for a while as long as it's focused on themselves. But once the focus is off of themselves, they'll start to fade away. And they said some of that seed will fall on weedy soil. And that's where the kind of people who hear about Jesus, but they just kind of add them to their life. They just kind of add them on. I've got all this other stuff. I'll just add Jesus on. But Jesus says, you know, if you do that with me, all that other stuff that you should drop off of your life, but you're not doing that, will, will crowd you, crowd me out. And they'll fall away. But he said, some of the seed will fall on good soil. And when it falls on that good soil, that's a person who's got a surrendered heart. They submit to Jesus as Lord of their lives. And then we went on to, he talked about the sower specifically, the guy sowing the seed. He said, the sower is evangelistic. He says he, this light that he has, this gospel message that he has, he doesn't put it under a basket. He doesn't put it under the bed. No, he lets that light shine, this little light of mine. And then the sower is authentic. He's, he's out. He's, he's not ashamed of this message that God has given to him, this gospel that he has. And this sower is fruitful, he's growing, he's putting himself in a place to know more about God and know more about Jesus. And then the last one, the sower is obedient. The sower calls him Lord. And when he calls him Lord, it's not just to hear him, but it's also to do what he says. I was thinking, up to this point, he's talking to these disciples, what have they seen so far? Because we've been going through this whole book of Luke. What have they seen so far? Well, they've seen Jesus' power over the demons. And that happened in the synagogue, in the church, in Capernaum. And they saw a man delivered from a demon in, in that place. So they saw Jesus' power over that. Then they saw Jesus' power over diseases. And this one started off with Peter's mother-in-law, who was on, basically on her deathbed. And Jesus comes in and heals her, and she's healed so well, she gets up and starts to serve them. And then they saw Jesus' power over debt, over debt, over sin. When the paralytic is lowered down into the house, 
Instead of Jesus instantly healing him uh, so he can walk again, he says to him, he spiritually heals him, and he says, your sins are forgiven you. Gets him in a lot of trouble for saying that. But, but they saw his power over debt. Then they saw his power over death. Over death. They're coming into the town of Nain. And there's a funeral coming out. And Jesus stops the funeral. But he doesn't just physically stop the funeral. He spiritually stops the funeral in a sense that this guy gets raised from the dead. The funeral is over. And he reunites this only son with his widowed mother. And now, today, we're going to look over Jesus' power over the deep. Jesus' power over the deep. Verse 22. One day, he and his disciples got into a boat. And he told them, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. So they went out. I've got this divided into three sections here. The first is the calm before the storm. The calm before the storm. It's a, it's a beautiful day. And, and Jesus has been ministering to thousands of people. And, and he, he looks at his disciples and says, you know, we, we need to get away. He's worn out. He's tired. He, and so he says, let's take a vacation. Let's, get, let's hop in these boats and let's go over to the other side. At least when we're on the water, then it's not going to be so um, full in there. And then he says, there, there are disciples with them. Now, I want to explain that because disciple just means learner or student. That's all it means. And so at this time, Jesus had a lot of disciples. I know we usually think of the 12 disciples, and those 12 disciples were there. But there were many, many other people that were following Jesus also. And they were just, they were really curious. Some of them were intrigued by what Jesus was saying. So here's a whole bunch of disciples that are following him. And some of these are possible non-believers, Possible non-believers. They're just really intrigued with this guy named Jesus. And so we've brought out this passage before, John 6, 66. It says, from that moment on, many of his disciples, there's that word, turned back and no longer, no longer accompanied him. So there were a lot of people that were following Jesus, just really curious about him, but, but they didn't completely follow him. So here's this whole group. Just a couple things to note. Who told them to get in the boat? Jesus told them to get in the boat. It was Jesus' idea to get in this boat, to get away from all these crowds, to have some peace and quiet out on the lake. Uh, where, were, where were they to go? They were to go to the other side. That's what Jesus said. We're going to get in these boats, and we're going to go to the other side. They're on the west side of the Sea of Galilee. They're going to go to the east side of the Sea of Galilee. They're on the northern tip. And they're going to go all the way across. And Jesus makes the impression that we're going to get in these boats. And that's where we're going to end up. We're going to end up over there. And they started by obeying Jesus. They started by obeying Jesus. Jesus said it. So what did they do? They got in the boats. And they started off to the other side. They started by obeying Jesus. Now, verse, next verse, 23. As they were sailing... He fell asleep. And then a fierce windstorm came down on the lake and they were being swamped and were in danger. Now here's the second one. Here's the calm in the storm. The calm in the storm. We find out it's a sailing ship. So it's, a, it's probably a fishing boat, but it's got a sail. And um, Mark tells us in his gospel that there are multiple boats. There's not just one boat. There's, there's multiple, so there's a bunch of guys that are there. And the Sea of Galilee was prime for these kind of storms. Just a little uh, geographic here is that the, the Sea of Galilee is 690 feet below sea level. Around the Sea of Galilee are all these mountain ranges. And so a storm would come over the mountain ranges and the, the wind would just pick up velocity and just swoop down like a funnel right over the Sea of Galilee. So you could be on the Sea of Galilee and it's just beautiful and wonderful and just as calm as could be and a storm could quickly come over the mountains and boom, you are in danger, in big time danger. The boat is getting swamped and you're not sure what to do. So we see in this passage Jesus is human because what's Jesus doing before the storm comes? He's sleeping, isn't he? He's sleeping. He's tired. He's exhausted. He's been teaching. He's been healing people. There's thousands upon thousands of people all the time, and you know what it's like to be around a lot of people all the time. You just get tired of it, and you get like, I gotta get away. And so one of the versions says he finds a, a little pillow, and he lays down, and he, can you feel the waves? 
and he, and he falls asleep. So we see he's human. If you've been around the Great Lakes for a long time, for any time, there's one storm that you know about. It happened in November of 1975. 43 years ago. It happened on Lake Superior. There was a freighter called the Edmunds Fitzgerald. It was on its way across to ultimately head to Cleveland. And uh, it never made it there. It never made it to the other shore. And there was such a fierce storm on Lake Superior that night that it tore that vessel apart. And there were 29 men who lost their lives that night on that. It, they, they never made it to the other side. Uh, Gordon Lightfoot wrote a song about it, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, a year later. And it, here's one of the lines in that song. It's about in the third or fourth verse. It says, Does anyone know where the love of God goes when the waves turn the minutes to hours? What a beautiful line. Can I ask you this morning, have you ever been in a storm like that? A storm in your life where you realize that, wow, I'm going under. I don't know which way to turn. And, and, and the, the waves have turned the minutes to hours. I mean, I, should, I, I was just clicking right along. I was just sailing across the lake. It was a really nice day and everything else. And then all of a sudden, boom, this hits. And, and what should have taken just a little shorter time now seems like hours. When is this storm ever going to end? And, and where, where is the love of God? Where, where does the love of God go? Where, where, is, where is God when those kind of storms in life come about? And what do I do? Well, let's just look at the next verse. They, meaning the disciples, came and woke him up saying, Master, Master, we're going to die. And then he, re he got up, he rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was calm. Here's the third one. The third one is the calm after the storm, the calm, calm after the storm. And the storm is no surprise for Jesus. Remember, who told them to get in the boat? And who told them where they were going to go? He, he knew about this storm. He knew all about it. Now, when you look at storms, there are... A couple different types of storms that we have in life. I mean, there's a lot of storms, but they fall in these two categories. There's a chastening storm. A chastening storm is that you've brought it upon yourself. You're, you're far from God. You're not doing what God has told you to do. You're holding on to something you know that you need to repent of. And therefore, you've got a storm in your life because you're starting to feel the consequence of that condition that you're in, in the sin that you're in. And so you have a storm coming on your life. And, and, and that's one type of storm. The other type of storm is a strengthening storm. It's a kind of a storm that you go through that it, you're not sinning, you're not, you're not doing something wrong, but you're going through this patch in your life and you're wondering, why is this happening to me? Well, that's a strengthening storm. That's a storm to help you strengthen in your faith. And most likely what's going to happen once you go through that storm and your faith is strengthened, you're going to turn around and help somebody else who's going through the same type of storm. So there's those two kind of storms, the chastening storm, strengthening storms. Both storms bring you to Jesus. No matter which kind of storm you're going on in life, you need to do the exact same thing that, they, that the disciples did. Where did they go? They went and found Jesus. They woke him up. That's the exact same thing that we need to do in the storms of life that we're going to. We need to go find Jesus and we need to wake him up. And here's an interesting fact. Um, in this passage in Luke, he, they say, Master, Master. And that means the person in charge. Hey, person in charge, you're the one that told us to get in the boat. You're the one that told us to go to the other side. It's kind of your fault that we're in the middle of the storm. You didn't check the weather channel. Come on, Jesus. Yeah. So some of them call him Master. Now, it's interesting, in the book of Matthew, when it tells about this, they call him Lord. Um, that Lord is, means I belong to you. I am yours. That's what it means by Lord. 
And then in the book of Mark, when it gives its uh, description of this, it says teacher, teacher, meaning the person with knowledge that, that they're coming to it. Now, I looked at that and I thought, wow, that really shows the different types of people that are following after Jesus at this time. There are some of them who are following after him and coming to him and going, I'm in this because of you. You're in charge. You're at fault. Kind of pointing their finger at Jesus. Get us out of this. Or you could be some of them are coming to him going, teacher, teacher. Some of them are following say, hey, you got a lot of knowledge. Uh, why don't you tell us what you think of the situation? We'll evaluate what you say and we'll lay it up alongside of other what other people say and we'll make a judgment call here. You know, there are some people like that that are following Jesus. But then there are some that were following Jesus that are on their knees before him saying, I'm yours, whatever, whatever we go through. You said that we'd make it to the other side, and I'm going to go wherever you go. And they called him Lord. So here's what happens. Jesus responds after the, after the wind and the waves. He just speaks and, boom, you know, it's, 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 it's calm. It's almost like the wind and the waves go, Hey, I've heard that voice before at creation. <laughs> and boom, it's, everything is calm. And then there's this response. He said to them, Jesus said to them, Where is your faith? They were fearful and amazed, asking one another. Then they respond, Who then is this? He even commands the winds and the waves, and they obey him. Now, um, they, they have faith. Just where did it go? And can I appeal to you again, if you're going through a storm in life, I've gone through storms in my life, I have faith, but sometimes when I'm in the storm, I don't know where my faith went. It kind of vaporizes. It's like, whew, you know, I know all that stuff, I know about God, I know what He can do and everything else and all, all that, but when you're in the midst of the storm, sometimes you, you're like, where did it go? And you need somebody to come up to you and say, where is your faith? You need somebody to come up to you and say, the Bible says this, hold on to that. So it's not out of the ordinary for us to have that, maybe that question, ask of us, where is your faith in this storm? Now, here is a neat thing. I, I, I was, I'm going to take the time to do this. But in Psalms, um, there are songs which help the people describe their God. And so they, they use a lot of pictures and imagery. How do we describe God? What's one way to describe God? And so in the book of Psalms, there's a way in which they describe an attribute of God. So let's walk through these. Uh, Psalm 29, 3 and 4 says, The voice of the Lord is above the waters. The God of glory thunders, the Lord above the vast water, the voice of the Lord in power, the voice of the Lord in splendor. So one of the ways they described their God was that this God is so powerful that all he got to do is just speak. And he has authority over nature. He has authority over the waters. That was just one way of them describing their God. Now, if we go to chapter 65, verse 7, you're going to see that this is not just a one-time deal. They says there, you silence the roar of the seas and the roar of their waves and the tumult, the, the storms of the nations. So there he says it again. This is one way that we describe our God. He, he has this power, this unbelievable power, and they use the waves and the, and the storms as that he's powerful over that. Let's go to another one, 89, verse 9. You're going to see it again. So these are, these are common things that they would have been singing about their God. We do it today. We still do it today. So Psalm 89, 9 says, You rule the raging sea. When its waves surge, you still them. So that's how they're describing their God. Their God is one who can still the waves. Let me give you another one. 93, 4. 93, verse 4. Greater than the roar of a huge torrent, the mighty breakers of the sea, the Lord on high is majestic. He's mightier than all of that. Now let me give you one more. And I don't know if you've ever seen this one before, but 107, starting at verse 23. 
and see if you can hear the event that we're reading about a thousand years later in the New Testament, okay? Verse, starting in verse 23, Others went to the sea in ships, conducting trade upon the vast water. And they saw the Lord's works and his wondrous works in the deep. And he spoke and raised a stormy wind that stirred up the waves of the sea. Who told them to get into the boat? Jesus told them to get into the boat. Where were they to go? To the other side. Rising up to the sky, sinking down into the depths, their courage was melting away in anguish. You see the waves rising up and coming down, and they're fearful in anguish. Uh, it says they reeled and staggered like a drunkard, and all their skill was useless. I don't know if you've ever been on a sea like that, on a boat like that, when it's been that bad, where you can't even hardly stand up. You're holding on to, for dear life onto one side of the boat or the other, and you look drunk. That's what you look like. And even if you are a very skilled sailor, you realize, man, I'm in trouble when that water's coming up over and I'm bailing water out of the boat. He's, he's describing them. And then it says, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. These people went and woke up Jesus. He stilled the storm to a whisper, and the waves of the sea were hushed. It gives us directly, exactly what Jesus did in the New Testament when he got up and he rebuked the wind and the waves. But here's the difference in verse 30. They rejoiced when the waves grew quiet. Then he guided them to the harbor they longed for, and, and let them give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love and his wondrous works for all humanity. Let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the council of the elders. Now, I, I read all that to you because that, uh, you know, Jesus is human, but we also see God Jesus here. And this question that the disciples have is rhetorical. It's a rhetorical question. Who then is this? Well, there's, the answer is God. Because that's all they sing about when they sing about their God. Is he has all this power over the water. And what is this guy? Who is this? This guy calms the sea. Who is in the boat? God is in the boat with us. So they started by fearing the storm outside the boat. But now they feared who was in the boat. I mean, it was all about the storm outside of the boat and everything that was going on outside of the boat. But now that that storm is gone, they are shaken in their boots about who is standing in the boat, in the boat. So let me wrap it up this way. Can Jesus calm your storm? Can Jesus calm your storm? Whatever storm that you're going through in life, can he calm it? Um, Jesus never promised us a no storm life. He didn't promise us that. John 16, says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. There's the storms. Jesus is telling us, you will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. Now, Jesus did promise to get a, you to the other side through the storm. That's what he promised. He didn't promise that there wouldn't be any storms. There will be storms. But he promised he would get you to the other side. Just like he told the disciples, get in the boat, we're going to the other side. There's no doubt, even though a storm is coming, that they're going to get to the other side. James 1.12 says, Blessed is the one who endures trials, that's storms, because he has stood the test, that's storms. He will receive a crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. That's the other side. Let me give you one from the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 31.8 says, The Lord is the one who who will go before you, he will be with you, he will not leave you or abandon you. Do not be afraid or discouraged. So whatever the storm is in your life, it's a, if it's a chastening storm, a storm where it's because you are out of step with God, um, you need to go before, you need to wake him up. Or if it's a strengthening storm where he's strengthening your faith, you need to go before him and wake him up. So I'll end with two questions because there were two questions. Will you wake up Jesus? Whatever kind of storm that you're in in life, will you wake up Jesus? Will you go and shake him? Will you, will you say, Jesus, I need your help? Will you talk to him? Will you pray to him? Will you say, Jesus, 
I need to pour this out before you. I feel like I'm going under and I'm getting swamped and I need your help. Will you wake up, Jesus? The second one is what will you call him when you go wake him up? What will you call him? Will you call him teacher? You know, like, well, I'll listen to you, Jesus, whatever you have to say. I'll evaluate it and see how it measures up with what I think. Will you call him that? Or will you call him master? Like, will you kind of go to him, sticking your finger at him? Like, you got me into this. It's your fault. You need to get me out of this. You know, will you, will you go at him like that? Or will you go at him as Lord? Will you go before him and kneel before him and say, I belong to you. And I'm not quite sure in this situation why I'm going through what I'm going through. But I know that you're going to get me to the other side. And you are still Lord of my life. I belong to you. I belong to you. How will you call him when you walk to him? Let's bow our heads in prayer. And praise team, feel free to come forward and for our last song. So, Heavenly Father, thank you for this passage of Scripture. Thank you that we have the opportunity, Lord, to see a passage that really relates to our lives in a very real way. We all have walked through storms, and I, I, I wouldn't want to... Uh, I, I know that within our congregation here, there are people walking through storms right now. I know there, there, there's probably people walking through because they're not in a right relationship with you. They're ignoring you. They're ignoring how they should live to follow after you. And they're feeling the consequences of sin. Lord, I know there are people in our congregation that are definitely walking through the storms that are strengthening their faith. It's not because they've done something wrong, but they're, they're walking through this time to be strengthened, to realize that you are real and that you love them. And no matter how this all comes out, that you're going to get us to that other side. Their, their eyes are focused directly upon heaven. So, Lord, I pray that whatever storm we are in, we would wake you up. And we would come before you. And I pray that we would come before you as Lord. That we would come humbly before you on our knees and say, I belong to you. Lord, if there's anyone here this morning that, that couldn't do that, I pray that they would know that they could and that you, would want, you, you desire to be called Lord and that you're more than a teacher, you're more than a master. You're, you're the person that we follow after no matter what. Lord, thank you that you strengthen our faith when we need it. And thank you that you bring the storms of life when we are sinning, when we are going the opposite direction we're supposed to be going, that you love us so much that you bring us into a storm. Lord, may we wake you up. We ask this in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing, I Stand Amazed.